We're going to continue our study of the saints only doctrine. Uh, as I mentioned at the very beginning of this, I was in a discussion with uh, some who believe this doctrine a few years ago and trying to enter into debate with them. Then shortly after that, I got a question from another part of the, the nation regarding this subject. And then one of the men that we support financially, uh, Brother Silverio Introso, uh, regularly has difficulty with those that hold this position. So it does warrant some study that can the church, out of its church treasury, help in a benevolent way those who are not Christians. The saints only believe you can only help those who are Christians and cannot help out of the church treasury those who are not Christians. But these brethren also believe that if a congregation helps a non-Christian out of the church treasury, a non-saint, then that congregation sins, and those who do so uh, are going to be hell-bound, unless, of course, they would repent. If congregation just simply teaches the acceptability of such, the same thing would be the case. This is seen uh, specifically in their debate propositions and uh, Earl Bingham, in his debate with Alan Hires, affirmed the scriptures teach that in benevolence, churches of Christ may relieve saints only. Now, he doesn't get quite as explicit as A.C. Grider did in his debate with W.L. Toddy, in which A.C. Grider affirmed <clears throat> that the Bible teaches that it is a sin for the church to take money from the church treasury to buy food for needy, destitute children, and those who do so will go to hell. Now, that is very explicit as to their teaching. That is what they actually believe. As we went through this, we looked at their primary arguments. Basically, their primary argument is that of examples, that in the New Testament, you only see examples of giving aid to saints, and you do not see any examples of giving aid to non-saints, at least not out of the church treasury. And then a second argument that they used, and we answered those arguments at the time, but that of fellowship, that it would place us in fellowship by giving money to a non-saint. It would place us in fellowship with that non-saint, and it's sinful for the church to have fellowship with a non-saint. Of course, they always would say that they would take money and help out of their own pocket, and if it places the church in fellowship with the non-saint, why wouldn't it place the individual in fellowship with the non-saint then? And wouldn't that be just as much condemned as the other? The major passages that a great deal of the question comes up is, first, 2 Corinthians 9 and verse 13, that while by the experiment of this ministration they glorify God for your professed subjection unto the gospel of Christ, for your liberal distribution unto them and to, unto all men. And they would hold various positions unto the all men there, that some of them would hold that it has reference to saints, and thus unto them, Christians, and unto all saints. Others would hold that the unto all men refers back to unto them. 
And then there's others who would hold that the unto them would be the Jewish Christians and unto all men, having reference to all Christians. But in each one of these views, the unto all or unto all men, always Christians. Uh, and we're going to come back and just pay attention to that unto all there because we'll come back and discuss that in more detail this afternoon. Another passage would be Galatians 6 and verse 10, as we therefore have opportunity to do good, or as we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. And generally, the view in which they hold of this is that this is individual action only. And uh, since it is individual action, it, the church cannot do it. We might get to that view a little bit more detail this afternoon as well. Uh, but if it is a sin for the church to engage in doing good unto all men, then what about the context? You go back to verse 1 and you look at verses 1 through 9, and you, is it a sin for the church to engage in any of those things? For example, restoring such a one, verse 1. Bearing burdens, verse 2. Or verse 6, paying the preacher. Uh, is that individual action only? Or is that an action that can be done by individuals or by the church? The other passage is James 1 and verse 27. The pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. Again, those who would hold the saints only view hold that this is individual action and is not to be practiced by the church. In fact, uh, we noted at the time, Eugene Bitwell, Britwell, I'll get it right in a minute, Brittnell, in his debate with Guy N. Woods, affirmed that the scriptures teach that it is sinful for pure and undefiled religion to be done by the church in caring for widows and orphans in an organized organization such as Mount Door or like facilities when properly supervised by Christians sinful for the church to practice pure and undefiled religion. Why? Because this is individual action and thus it's sinful for the church to engage in it. But I want us to look at this unto all that we mentioned both in 2 Corinthians 9 and verse 13 and Galatians 6 and verse 10. All and if you notice in both passages, men is italicized, showing that's not a part of the original, it is literally unto all. All is from the Greek word pantos, from the word pos. It is found 88 times in 84 verses in the New Testament. Yet, if the argument being made unto all must refer to Christians only, yet they're not willing in all of these 88 times that it's used to argue that it never refers to a non-saint. Uh, yet they should. Gus Nichols stated that the Greek word pantos, when used apart from some other word meaning man, is translated all men 11 times in the New Testament and does not mean saints only a single time. Now then, when you look at the Greek language, you can oftentimes use a word in a masculine form or in a neuter form. Neuter form deals with things. We might be referring to all things. You would use a neuter voice. 
or neuter. When you're dealing with people, you'd use the masculine. All men thus. And so he is saying, when it's referring to man, the 11 times in the New Testament, not one time does it mean saints only. But these two passages that we're considering, 2 Corinthians 9, 13, and Galatians 6, and verse 10, use a modifying word with it. And those, it's two modifying words, uh, or two different words. In 2 Corinthians 9 and verse 13, the unto all has the preposition ice or ace. And thus it's ace pantos in the Greek. This exact phrase, ace pantos, is found 14 times in 13 verses in the New Testament. Now then, just for emphasis sake, I want us to at least go through these, these verses. And remember, if the argument of the saints only doctrine is true, it must refer to saints only all of these times. Romans 3 and verse 22. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all that believe, for there is no difference. Again, it has to refer to saints only. Romans 5 and verse 12. Actually, Paul uses, it's found more in Romans than any place else, but in Romans 5 and verse 12. Whereas by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Now then, you take this as saints only. Who's going to argue the position that sin entered the world and death by sin, so death passed upon all Christians or all saints. <laughs> and yet that's the position that would be necessitated. Does that mean that those who are not saints are not, they have not sinned? Romans 5 and verse 18 then. Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification. All men to condemnation, is that saints only? And then the free gift came un upon all saints unto justification. We would seem to have a little bit of a difficulty in harmonizing saints only with this phrase upon all men. Romans 10 and verse 12. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. Rich unto all. Well, you might be able to argue that this is dealing with saints in this passage. But it could also have reference to all men and not just saints. In Romans 16 and verse 19, For your obedience has come abroad unto all men, I am glad, therefore, on your behalf, but yet I would that ye wise, that ye, I, but yet I would have you wise unto that which is good and simple concerning evil. Your obedience has come abroad unto all men. What is the Romans' obedience only known to those who are saints? 
is it limited to saints only? Or could it reference to those who are non-saints know about their obedience as well? Ephesians 1 and verse 5. Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and love unto all the saints. You have a parallel passage that I'm just going to add with it, Colossians 1 and verse 4. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love which ye have unto all the saints. Now notice this. This has a qualifying statement to show the unto all has reference to a specific group of individuals. Here, unto all saints. Now if we went back to... St. Corinthians 9, 13, where is that qualifying statement when he says that for your liberal distribution unto them and unto all men? You see the difference when he is qualifying it? Unto them and unto all men as opposed to, to all the saints in both of these passages? Obviously, there's a qualifying statement here that limits it to all saints. But it limits, it limits it by the qualifying statement in the verse. 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 12. And the Lord make you to increase and abound in love one toward another and toward all men, even as we do toward you. Are we to increase and abound in love toward one another and toward saints only? Or would that be inclusive of those who are not saints? Can we, if we were emphasizing the point a little bit more, can we then hate those who are not saints? We don't have to love them, do we? Our love is to abound toward one another and toward all saints. Doesn't say anything about those who are not saints if the saints only position that unto all deals with only saints. But obviously, our love is to abound toward everyone, saint or non saint. 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse 10. And indeed, ye do it toward all the brethren which are in all Macedonia. But we beseech you, brethren, they increase more and more. Here, toward all the brethren. You again have that limiting statement, that qualifying statement, to toward all the brethren. Again, you don't find something like that, though, in 2 Corinthians 9.13. In 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 15. See that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever, but ever follow that which is good among yourselves and to all men. So can we, that one who's not a Christian, do we, can we render evil for evil to that individual? Do we only have to follow good among those who are Christians? Would not the among yourselves and unto all men and be inclusive of everyone? Very similar to what we see in St. Corinthians 9 and verse 13. Philemon, verse 5. Hearing of thy love and faith which thou hast toward the Lord, and toward all saints. Again, you see a qualifying statement there. Toward all saints. In which he is dealing with a specific group. And everyone within that group. Then Jude verse 25. And it's not even translated here actually. Uh, to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion, power, both now and ever. The ever there literally is into all the ages. 
in the idea is into all is this Greek phrase, ace pantos. And it just translated along with ages into all the ages, thus ever. So those are the times in which this phrase is used in the New Testament. When we turn over to Galatians 6 and verse 10 then, as we therefore have opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially those who are of the household of faith. It has the preposition pros, thus it's pros pantos instead of eis pantos. This phrase is found seven times in the New Testament. And again, we'll go through these seven verses. In Luke chapter 9 and verse 23, he said unto them all, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. If any man, is that if any saint only will follow him? Should we limit this to saint only? In Luke 12 and verse 41, Then Peter said unto him, Lord, speakest thou this parable unto us? Or even to all, to all there. Should that be limited to all saints? Or to everyone that Jesus was setting forth a parable for all people? In Acts 22 and verse 15, For thou shalt be his witness unto all men of that which thou hast seen and heard. Now, you might, we reference Acts twenty two sixteen quite often, where Ananias tells Saul, Why tearest thou rise and be baptized? So Ananias is speaking to Saul, and you're going to be a witness unto all men. Should we take that unto all men as being unto all saints? Or does it include non-saints? I think that answers the question just to ask it and point it out. In 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 14, Now we exhort you, brethren, uh, warn them that are unruly, comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, be patient toward all men. Do I have to be patient toward those who are saints? Or is it toward all individuals? In St. Thessalonians 2 and verse 24, The servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient. Again, do we have to be gentle only toward those who are saints? Or is it, does it, would it include non-saints? And then Titus 3 and verse 2, To speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers, but gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. Again, do we only have to show meekness toward those who are saints? Or would it include non-saints as well? See, the usage of the terms that are found in Galatians 6 and verse 10 and 2 Corinthians 9 and verse 13 are not consistent with the phrase all men having reference to saints only. It just isn't. The phrase instead is inclusive of saints and non-saints, which would be harmonious with the actual word. But to be consistent, to be consistent, those who argue for saints-only position must say that every time the phrase is used, it only has reference to saints. And it excludes those who are not saints. Now then, I want us to look at some arguments. And this is a phrase that we oftentimes hear about collective obligations. 
it is, and I'm going to state it's a, a straw man argument, that the church can do anything the individual can do. Well, in fact, uh, Wayne Walker, who holds the saints only position, was writing and said that whatever members as individuals do, the church as a whole can do. No one that I know of believes such. I certainly don't. And if someone should argue such, <laughs> I'm going to debate them. I'm, going, I'm not going to accept that. It's ludicrous. And we would say that it, such includes the use of church funds. It's obvious that there are individual obligations and there's a church obligations. That's what these two boxes that I wanted to try to illustrate what we're talking about. There is the fact you have individual obligations. You have obligations that are given to the church. There's no question about that. There are certain obligations that are given to me as an individual Christian or an individual that it would not be right for the church to do those things because it's individual action. The question, though, is can those obligations ever in any way overlap? where there are both individual and congregational obligations? That's the real question. And that's the, the point that many do not wish to really deal with. Do obligations... Uh, well, let me just go back to this other one for a second. Do obligations to the individual and obligations to the church ever overlap. Now, saint's only position says there can never be that overlapping obligation. If that third box there, overlapping obligation, so they would say there are never any thing that is given both to the individual and to the church. There is never any overlapping uh, between those two things or obligations. But in a minute, we'll see if they'll be consistent with that. Question then that we are faced with, upon what basis do we determine when there is an overlap between individual obligations and church obligations? All God-given obligations that exist upon the basis of one's being a Christian and that are equally related to all Christians are obligations that apply to both the individual Christian and the local church. And that's an important statement, and that's why I kind of read it specifically. God-given obligations that exist upon the basis of one's being a Christian. Let me go back to the idea for just a second. Individual responsibilities. God has made the man the head of the home. He is to train up, bring up his children, nurturing the admonition of the Lord. That is an obligation of fathers. But is that upon the basis and that obligation upon the basis of be, one's being a Christian? Would you say that the non-Christian has that same obligation? Well, yes, he does. And so 
while that is an obligation that's given to an individual that would not be the responsibility of the church, yet it's not an obligation that is upon the basis of that individual father being a Christian or not. Second, it's not relate, equally related to all Christians because, well, for example, my wife never could be a father. I mean, we know that. Women are not going to be fathers. Thus, it's not equally related to all Christians. And so both of those aspects upon one, Here's God-given obligations upon the basis of one's being a Christian and equally related to all Christians. When you have both of those situations, then there are obligations that apply both to the individual and to the local church. Now let me just put it another way. That most, if not all people, will at least admit that all Christians in a local church act as a functioning unit, then that church is acting, that local, you have a lo situation where the local church is acting. If we are all doing something as a individual Christians, but we're all doing it together, then is it not the local church doing it? If all Christians in a local church, local congregation, are equally related to a given obligation, then that would also mean that the local church of which they are a member is also related to that same obligation. Now then, I need to make a, the point that this is working in the area of obligations. Obligations are things which must be done. We don't have a choice in it. It's not something that is authorized optional. These are obligations that God has given. They must be done if we're going to remain a Christian to faithfully discharge our responsibility to God, these are things that must be done. And they are obligations that are only for Christians. They don't refer to those who are not Christians. And these obligations are only because they are Christians. Now then, give some illustrations to try and help out. What about preaching the gospel to the lost? Is that an individual responsibility and obligation that we have based upon the fact that we are Christians and we have that only because we are Christians to preach the gospel to the lost? Is that not an obligation that every single Christian has? Is it an obligation that the church possesses then? Must the church, as the church, a collective unit, preach the gospel to the lost? Thus you have individual obligation of preaching the gospel to the lost as a Christian and congregational obligation of preaching the gospel to the lost. There are two aspects of or an obligations both to the individual and to the church which it overlaps it's both individual and congregational action same could be said in edif edifying the brethren when we edify one another do we have the obligation as Christians to edify one another is that not an individual responsibility that I have that you have of edifying one another of course it is, as Christians. Those ob that obligation is because we are a Christian. Does the church as a collective unit 
as the church, working as the church, have an obligation to edify brethren. Well, that's upon the basis, very basis of our Bible classes, our preaching and teaching. The church has that obligation. But it's also an individual action. You have individual and collective church obligation. Benevolent aid, and let me limit this in this discussion right now to saints. Since they believe that you can help saints out of the church treasury, they, they will thus agree that in benevolent aid to saints that it is congregational action, but they also hold it as an individual action, that they can do it as an individual. And thus, here is individual and a congregation, both. What about the singing of psalms, hymns, spiritual songs? I mentioned, of course, Ephesians 5, 19, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. And Colossians 3, 16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your heart to the Lord. Now then, this is something that is many times brought up in a discussion dealing with mechanical instruments and music. That Ephesians 5.19 and Colossians 3.16 is not dealing with the worship service. It's individual action. Go back and read the context of Ephesians 5 and Colossians 3.16. Or Colossians 3. See if it's dealing with a time in which we come together to assemble and worship to God, or if it's dealing with individual action as we live our life. The question then comes, does that singing of psalms, hymns, spiritual songs not only apply to the individual, but to the congregation as the whole when we come together? Do, are we under the obligation to sing psalms, hymns, spiritual songs? Well, of course we are. And thus you would have individual obligation and congregational obligation, both of them. Well, after taking the Lord's Supper, in 1 Corinthians 11th chapter, verse 23 through verse 34, and we won't read it for time's sake, but here it's... Paul is dealing with the church at Corinth and their abuses of the Lord's Supper. But it is a congregational action. But within this, notice verse 28 and then verse 34. But let a man... Did you catch that? But let a man... Thought he was writing to the church. And yet he uses a man. Examine himself and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup and then verse 44 if any man hunger let him eat at home that you come not together in condemnation the rest will I set in order when I come you see you have and Paul is requiring a man singular to collectively perform the individual duty to observe the Lord's Supper in the assembly. That each individual man in that assembly is to eat that bread and drink that cup. What about giving? In 1 Corinthians 16 and verse 1 and verse 2, <clears throat> Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by in store as God has prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. Notice in this, the churches of Galatia. He's writing to churches. Congregational action. 
when he says the churches of Galatia in verse 1, he said, even so do ye. Ye is plural. So here's the churches of Galatia, the church at Corinth. But then notice, let every one of you, that's singular. Singular action in relationship to the plural congregation, where the individual obligation overlaps with the congregational obligation, that both are there. Now then, if you apply that principle to Galatians 6 and verse 10 and James 1 and verse 27, that this is individual only action, when you start saying that there are individual action and collective action that overlap many times, then the contention that this is individual action in those verses falls. We have certain responsibilities as Christians, as individuals. We have obligation to become a Christian through our faith, repenting of our sins, confessing our faith in Jesus Christ as God's Son, being baptized in water for the forgiveness of our sins. That's something that we as individuals do. We bear our own responsibilities. There are certain things that are congregational responsibilities that we as congregations do. We must make sure that we do them as a congregation. But many times those things overlap. Doing good unto all men, especially those of the household of faith, would certainly be both collective and individual action. The liberal distribution that is made unto them, the saints, and unto all men deals with both individual and collective actions. But if you as an individual have never obeyed the gospel, you need to do so this afternoon. If through failure on your part to live in the way that God wants you to live and in harmony with his will... You need to respond and to let us pray with you for the forgiveness of your sins. As an individual, you do that. Why? So that you can have that eternal home with God in heaven. If we can help you in that, then we would encourage you to come as we stand and sing the invitation.